So gentlemen, how many guys reading this or listening to this are alive but not living? They're in a rut and life has robbed them of the eye of the tiger. If that's you, take it back. That's what my guest, Jim Ramos says, and he does incredible work with Men in the Arena and the Men in the Arena podcast. So we welcome, now we welcome my brother, Jim, onto the show. Hey, thanks so much for having me on, man. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah, I'm grateful that we could set this up and been looking forward to this. Just in case uh, maybe the audience doesn't know for sure who you are, uh, just if you could give a little bit of a bio, your kind of family story and why you do what you do. Yeah, man, I'm a 54-year-old dude. I've been married to my wife, the same only wife, married to one woman, the only woman since 92. So we're coming mm -hmm. on 28 years of marriage. She's uh, my best friend. We have a, a high-maintenance marriage. Two dynamic people that are uh, kind of doing this. It's either great or it's uh, rough and rocky sometimes. And so we, uh, <clears throat> we love those stable moments. Uh, and, and we're just growing together as a, a couple and just, uh, just loving the journey with her. Got uh, three uh, sons, 26, 24, and 22. All of them are doing well. And uh, one's a senior at Linfield College here in McMinnville. And he's uh, the starting punter, has been for four years. Awesome. The other two guys have graduated from universities in their, uh, in their real life and jobs and figuring out life in the 20s. And my middle son is getting married here in July. <clears throat> and life is good. That's I love to, I, I love uh, personally, my wife and I love to drink coffee together. And uh, we like to, now that my kids are out of the house, we uh, enjoy time on the couch watching a show while I rub her feet. And uh, I am a huge uh, avid hunter, love hunting, <clears throat> anything in the outdoors, uh, mountain biking, hiking, just love getting out in nature. Oh, good deal. So, yeah, I read in the man card that uh, just a couple of stories about you hunting. And I was just wondering, what's your favorite thing to hunt? You know what? As far as as far as family, I love that we love to hunt ducks and geese together. Ducks mainly. It's something I can do with the kids, the boys. We do it all together. They're into it on their own now. Mm. I really enjoy doing that with them. As far as personal reward and challenge, <clears throat> I'm a buck hunter. Hmm. I'm a buck hunter. I just, I, you know, I've killed three elk. I was fortunate enough to kill two Pope and young bulls archery, but hmm. I have a, been a forever rifle buck hunter. <laughs> and that's what I love to do. I don't know why. It's just what I do. Hey, nothing wrong with that. That's awesome. That is awesome. Yeah. I hunted uh, up until a couple of years ago, the land opportunity kind of dried up here, but a lot of, a lot of hunting, so the, the guys listening to this are avid hunters. So give us, oh. a, give us a, a good story. Give us a, just a crazy cool story from hunting. You're going to draw, you're going to draw the guys in. Okay. So I, 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 I read that question. I've got a, I need a clarifier here. Do you want a kill story? Do you want a, an adventure story? Do you want a, Oh crap, it went bad story. <laughs> Tell me what you want. Oh, I, got I, think I, want kind of I think I want the Oh crap, it went bad story first. Yeah, so I've got a lot of those, but the, the one that comes to mind is uh, uh, I wrote an article about this uh, in my own computer called the California Rodeo in Wyoming. Hmm. And so uh, uh, the, the, the day after 9-11, hmm. five of us dudes went to Wyoming for a, a high mountain wilderness mule deer hunt. I'd never hunted mule deer in my life, hmm. and I'd never hunted deer out of state in my life. And so I had no idea. What I was doing. I killed about 20 to 30 bucks in my before that. So I was a avid hunter, but I didn't know what to expect. And these guys said, Hey, we're going to get horses. <clears throat> well, I'm not a horseman and neither were they, <laughs> oh, but they're going to get horses. And I said, you guys, you know, I've been around horses. My wife was around horses. My grandpa had a ranch, you know, he had, a, uh, had horses. And I said, you, my dad had horses. And I said, man, you don't realize these are very temperamental animals. Uh, they, they uh, have a lot of problems when you're out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, I, I'm not really sold on this. And said, in fact, I said, I'm not going to pay for the, I'm not going to do that. I had just climbed Mount Whitney in a day, the tallest mountain in the United mm -hmm. States. And, and I was in great shape. I said, I'm just going to walk. They said, no, no, we're going to rent you a horse. We're going to take horses. <clears throat> so we get the horses from the outfitter. We get to the, the place and we get, how do we saddle these horses? One guy said, well, my daughter has a horse. So he, so he figured it out. Well, so my buddy gets on the, and you know, you know, there's a problem when the outfitter when he gives you the horses, takes the takes one of the horses, takes a rattle can, 
shakes it orange, sprays a circle with a line through it, and no. <laughs> Spray painted true story on this horse's chest. And he said, no matter what you do, only a man rides this horse. Don't put any dead deer on this horse. So I knew we were in trouble. So we skipped, we get that first morning, the day before the hunt, we saddle the horses up. My buddy gets on his horse. The, does, the saddle flips over backwards. So now the saddle's underneath the horse. He falls off. He breaks his brand new bino thousand dollar binoculars. Well, my other buddy who's already saddled up goes over to get the horse. He goes to reach for the horse. His reins fall off the horse and onto the other horse's saddle horn, which, which created panic. Now the front horse is kicking the back horse in the chest. Now we've got blood every year where we got a broken pair of binoculars. It was a disaster. And I think the climax of it was these guys, one day we said, hey, we're going to go up hunt up in the high country. We had hiked in and established a spike camp at about 9,500 feet. And our base camp was at about 7,500 feet. So we decided we're going to go horseback into our spike camp and spend the night. Or no, we're just going to go up there and check it out and come back. And I'm like, I'm not going to ride these horses. So I'm walking my horse in. Well, these guys are riding. We get way up high and one of the horses drops, just drops. What are we going to do with the horse? I don't know. Let's, uh, let's throw the saddle on your horse, Jim, and let's walk. Keep going. So we keep going. Pretty soon the second horse drops. What do we do? We don't know. I don't know. Shoot him? No, let's just leave him. So we throw Now my horse has two saddles on it. The other two horses got up and are following my horse, right? It's a, we're thinking these horses are going to die. We finally get to our spike camp, and the two guys that were there – had had an, another horse issue where the one that had the spray paint, uh, my buddy went to put the bit in his mouth. The horse reared back and rolled down the canyon. So they're like, "Hey, we got to get out of here. This horse is not in good shape." So now we, so we, by the time we get to the spike camp, we realize they're taking the only two horses that work, mine and the, the first group horse, the other group. And uh, so we're up there. We're like, we have to spend the night here because we got two horses that can't, three horses that can't walk. Mm. Well, I was not ready for spending the night in the wilderness. So we lay down to sleep. I'm I get hypothermic. I literally have two guys spooning me all night long. Wow. Anyway, it was a, it was a big disaster that actually got the horses got worse. The good news is we all killed bucks and we came out with a 32 inch wide four by four and another beautiful buck that scored 180. And wow. we had a great hunt. And, uh, but it was, uh, it was, uh, you know, the horses every night would shoot through their ropes and we have to find them and bring them back to camp. We had no idea what we were doing. It was a big disaster. Wow. But we killed our bucks. And then the funny part is, so one more story here. I know this is, so we were hauling them back 20 hours back to California. And I tell the guys, what are we going to do to haul these dead deer? You know, and he goes, oh, we do this all the time. We just wrap them up in tarp and go. I go, whoa, 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 whoa. It's warm weather. No, it's going to be fine. When we get into California, it's 90 degrees. So by the time I get to my house, I lived at a church parsonage. By the time we get to the parsonage, the bucks are green. We'd skinned all these bucks, but they're going rotten. Oh. So me and another guy, we take our, we're the only two guys that live in that town. We, we bone the bucks out, package the bucks. They're, they stink so bad, we threw most of the meat away. And we threw it in the church dumpster, which is down at the bottom right when you enter the church. Well, that was on a Saturday. The, church, the, dump, the, the trash comes every Friday. So six days later, I get a phone call. Hey, the police are at the church. Somebody reported dead bodies in the dumpster. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Wow. It was, it was the deer. We Californians, they don't understand deer and they're, you know, they're hunting and all that as much as a lot of us do. So anyway, pretty funny story. So uh, Wyoming, the California rodeo in Wyoming. So that was probably my most memorable, uh, one of my more memorable uh, experiences. <laughs> Oh, I could see why. I could also see that that absolutely needs to be a movie. Like, like that is just like one blunder after the other. It's like if if City Slickers hadn't already been done, it's like you guys were made for TV in that story. Well, the funny part is uh, we had killed the – we. I shot my buck, and when I shot my buck, a bigger buck stood up right behind it, mm -hmm. called my buddy up. He shot this big buck. Well, we're all excited about these bucks. We get a call on the radio. Another one of our horses went down, with, and it was, it was barely breathing. thought it was going to die. We finally got back to camp, got that, that horse. The outfitter finally came and replaced that horse, another horse. And the funny part is that horse that was the replacement horse was such a great horse. My buddy kept bragging about it. 
Well, when we took all the horses back to the outfitter, my buddy was bragging. He said, the, the outfitter said, well, you know, that horse that you're bragging about, his name was Sterling. That horse is out of my 50 horses. He's probably only my top 30, maybe. And my buddy said, what are you kidding me? Well, what about the horses we had? He goes, oh, I gave you our worst horses. And he said, why? He goes, well, what do you think I'm going to give good horses to a bunch of Californians don't know anything about horses? <laughs> oh. So the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> oh, that is wonderful. Yeah. Man, and that story just, you know, some stories they're told, they like, they lose mileage. Not that one. That one just oh, gains no. mileage every oh, time. Oh, baby. That is fantastic. Oh. I was so angry at the horses when I shot my deer. I have never pulled a trigger so hard in my life. I thought I pulled that trigger right through the trigger guard. I was so angry. <laughs> oh. Well, I really appreciate what, what you do and your work with men. And you have a podcast that is wildly successful, great content. And, and I just really, really appreciate what you say on your podcast, and you say this too, I need you to fill in this blank for me, and this will also set the stage for our conversation as we go along. You say this every single episode of your podcast, when a man gets it, everyone wins. Yes, and I believe that, but why is this true? Well, let's, let's look at this from a different angle, uh, uh, Chad. So our society, <clears throat> if you watch the media, if you watch television shows, if you watch anything, if you read the paper, you know, we have, we have, uh, as men, we have vilified ourselves. Mm -hmm. We have created a scenario to where it's easy for people to point a finger at men and go, it's those guys, it's their fault. Mm -hmm. You know, that's really true. You look at sex trafficking, you look at pornography use, you look at divorce rates, adultery, mm -hmm. uh, you look at the child, you know, 40% of children are born out of wedlock, 50% of children from divorce will not see their dad for an entire year. 80%, uh, it's like 80% of kids for, without parents are more likely to repeat a grade or be in jail. Uh, there's so many problems. Men are, there's no doubt when you talk to anybody, I mean, you can talk to the most right wing conservative, you can talk to the most leftist liberal, it does not matter who you talk to, they will all say the same thing. Men are, are a problem in our society. Mm -hmm. uh, my friend Wes Stafford, uh, president emeritus of um, Compassion International, said, if you fix the men, you fix 90% of the world's problems. Yes. So we're very, if, if, if logic, let's just use logic. Let's not use emotion here. Mm -hmm. If men are the problem, if men who, bad men, not strong men, but bad mm -hmm. men are the problem, then the only way that you can logically fix the problem is to fix the men because when a man gets it, everyone wins is, mm -hmm. is this is just as a powerful and truthful of a statement as saying when a man doesn't get it, everyone loses. Mm -hmm. But what we have done is we've tried to fix the symptoms. We've said, okay, we've got to fix sex trafficking. So we need to rescue these girls, which I, we, my wife and I financially support uh, an organization that does that. We believe in that, but we also believe that that is symptomatic of the true problem, which is these men who are trafficking these little girls, these little boys, right? right. Divorce. If you fix the man, you don't, you don't have to spend money on counselors and, and uh, you know, all, these, all these people getting these degrees in family counseling, mm -hmm. because if you fix the men, you, people don't need that anymore. And so this is, this is where we've given our life to fixing men because we've realized that if you fix a man, you fix four to six people in his family unit, and then you carry that out through generations. Mm -hmm. So the investment in men is so critical, mm -hmm. and it makes logical sense. I don't have to. I don't have. If I had Oprah Winfrey, if I was on her her show or somebody else like this, I would not have to argue with her. She would agree with that. Right. It's just something that we know this is true. Yeah, I love how you even frame that up because we know it's true and we can look logically, just look at the same, look at the numbers and what you're choosing to do. And I support you wholeheartedly in this and I agree with everything you just said. I think that so many times they look at those numbers, but yet it's skewed for a negative as just as a way of, of saying, no, you're the problem, meaning you, meaning men generally. Men are the problem, men are the problem. And you say, no, 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 it's not all men. It's the, it's the men who are broken. It's, the, it's, the, it's those who are, are not doing what they ought to as men. So logically, wouldn't it 
just makes sense to fix the quote unquote problem and not say that it's, it's the problem is men. The problem is broken men. Well, so Chad, you hit, you hit the nail on the head, bro. The problem is not men at all. The problem is males. Mm. You see, this is, so you talked about Wyoming. In Wyoming, I killed a little teeny mule deer. Uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a small little four point. We, but my buddies, two of my buddies killed giant mule deer mm. because a little two-year-old mule deer is very easy to kill because it is, even though it's genetically the same as a giant mule deer, it's a very different animal. So killing my little deer was like killing venison. Killing those big bucks was killing deer meat. And so what mm. people don't realize is a male is a different species from a man. They are different. Mm. They do different things. They act differently. They talk differently. Mm. Uh, Paul said in the, in the first Corinthians, you know, when I was a child, I act like a child. I thought like a child and I reason like a child. Mm -hmm. But when I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. And so what I'm saying, Chad, is, you know, this phrase toxic masculinity, it really is oxymoronic. Mm -hmm. Because uh, if you look at the definition, again, logically, unemotionally, objectively, looking at masculinity, the definition in the dictionary is to do things that are manly. Well, if I'm going to do things that are manly, I'm not going to be toxic because right. toxic males don't do manly things. <laughs> they do yeah. male or childish things. And so, uh, so what I would say is men are not the problem at all. Hmm. Men are the solution. Adult males masquerading as men are the problem. Hmm. Well said. Well Thank said. You. Yeah. I don't think that uh, for me, I, I've said this multiple times too, is there's really no such thing as toxic masculinity. Because it's either masculinity or it's not. Correct. Like, and that's just, I mean, to me that, so when, when they say, you know, again, toxic masculinity, I'm like, ah, I realize you may be using the same words, but we're, we're meaning two different things. So really you can't reason with people. <laughs> A lot of times you can't reason with them because they're redefining the terms. As well, you go here's, along. here's the deal, Chad. If you argue with an idiot, people can't tell the difference. So mm -hmm. a person who uses the phrase toxic masculinity, I'm not calling them idiots, but it, it's, it's, it's idiocy to think that mass they're, they're to watch them take a word that is objectively defined mm -hmm. and redefine it as something different. And that's the problem. So the problem is not masculinity. It's that they've taken that word and they've defined it. It's like when we were in English, you know, you're learning words like altruism or charlatan, and now you got to use it in a sentence. So mm -hmm. you put this word in a sentence and your teacher goes, yeah, you didn't use it right. <laughs> yeah. So, so this is the problem with masculinity, which is why I love using the word because mm. people get bent out of shape when they hear it. Mm. And, and in this, so now we kind of tee up the idea of, okay, what is a man? Now I will tell you this just for you who are listening today, the, the kind of terms that I'm going to attach to Jim, I heard on a podcast, but he's still working these out. So yeah. these are things we're just going to talk about and maybe further him a little bit along for the work he has going in the future. But I think that there's something here that's valuable, whether it's the main tenets of your, of your work that you're putting together now, Jim, or not. But I do think that there's something here that we can kind of dig into. So now let's talk about, we, we've dispelled the idea of toxic masculinity. So now what is, what is a man or how would you, how would you know a man if you saw it? Yeah. So I would say, so I, I'm right. I wrote a book that uh, I'm actually republishing and the book was called the man card, five characteristics separating men from boys. Mm -hmm. And we're actually re-releasing this book in the fall and we're under the title strong men, dangerous times five essentials for a man to change his world, right? Because when man gets it, everyone wins. So, mm -hmm. so under that premise, a man does, not is, not is, a man does, there are five things that men do that make him so. Mm -hmm. So in other words, a man is as a man does. You know, I'm a, I, you know, you're, you're on my screen, you see the you can see the football helmet back there and the pictures of dead animals. And I've got a mm -hmm. dead deer right there. And, you know, I've got dead turkey feathers over here. You know, so people think, oh, manhood is a, a, a guy that looks like a man. He's a big 
old football player who does this, mm-hmm. you know, uh, no, that's not true. You know, or men drive a truck or men are, they dress like men or they act like men or they talk or they talk like men. That's not true. You know, people think, oh, if you're a conservative, you're a man. If you're liberal, you're not a man. If you're liberal, you're not a man. And, or you're a man. If you're conservative, you're not. Or we attach all of these, mis- you know, mm-hmm. if you have pubic hair, you're a man, mm-hmm. right? So now you've got, pu- you're a man. No, there's all of these uh, myths around manhood. You know, if you have talent, you're a man. If you have, if you have possessions, you're a man. But then Jesus had no place to lay his head, the Bible says. So, right. so we have all of these myths surrounding manhood. But at the end of the day, manhood is function over form. It is utilitarian. So a man is a verb that describes a noun. So, so when I think of a man, I think of a man, he does five things. And if you imagine, if our listeners imagine a mountain. So there's a mountain that we're going to climb, and that mountain is called manhood. Mm-hmm. At the, and we have a five-book series for men curriculum called the the man card series. It's about these five, five traits. We have a book for each one. He starts at the trailhead. Now I do want to say this, Chad, I'm a, I'm a passionate follower of Jesus, Mm -hmm. but when we, when I'm talking about manhood, I'm talking about a a definition of manhood that transcends gen, uh, transcends religion, transcends race, transcends time. It's got to transcend all of these things. So I realize I'm talking on that language. So no matter what your listeners believe, this is true across the board. Mm -hmm. So when we define this, it had to be true across the board. Otherwise, it's not true at all, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times in church, we we make things churchy, and they're just not true, though. So Mm -hmm. the, the foundation, the trailhead of manhood, the first thing a man has to do is he needs to protect his integrity. Mm -hmm. integrity is foundational to manhood uh any good parent raises their children to be truthful honest you know loyal faithful anybody worth his salt will train their kids that way because and and with men uh, i have found this is not as important with women but as with men if you lack integrity you're done Mm -hmm. as a man You, you people don't respect you and respect is the greatest gift they can give you they give it to a man who has integrity so, and as you climb, so protecting integrity is the tra- trailhead. That's the first thing a man does. The second thing he does, he's climbing this mountain of manhood. So the climb, in my opinion, is the biggest battle a man can fight. And I'm actually reading a book right now that a friend of mine, Vince Miller, is getting ready to publish. And he says the same thing in his book, that, that apathy is the greatest battle a man will fight. We fight apathy. Mm-hmm. So we're as I'm climbing the mountain, like I did a five mile hike yesterday, my weight and the, the slope of the mountain is pushing me down and mm-hmm. I have to battle against it. And so as men, you know, when we talk about 40, uh, you know, 50% of kids won't see their dad for an entire year after a divorce, we're talking about a man who did not battle for his kids. So the definition of mm-hmm. apathy is indifference or, or callousness or, un, or uh, not able to feel or mm-hmm. care about the things you're supposed to care about. So as men, I need to care about my weight. I need to care about my health. I need to care about my church. Mm-hmm. I need to care about my wife, my family, my community. So that's the climb. He's mm-hmm. fighting constantly a battle because we live in a world that says men are toxic and they aren't the, sol- the, the solution to the problem. Mm-hmm. And so we have to battle that, right? So the summit of manhood, the apex, the climax, if you will, is pursuing God passionately so, uh, you know, I, 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 have, I have met, so Chad, not one pastor that I have served with or attended church under since 22 years old is no, not one is in ministry anymore. Wow. And they've all gone through either they went into the secular workforce, they've had moral failures. And so I have known uh, some dirt bags who are pastors. Mm-hmm. You have too. Mm-hmm. I have seen dozens of pastors fail morally and deeply, deeply wound people. And you have too. So for us to say, oh, you can't be, and I've met guys who are as pagan as pagan can be. I've met guys who don't want to talk about God there. They're like openly antagonistic against faith, but they are better men than a lot, some pastors I've known. Great men, really solid men. And that's hard for us in the church to admit that there are great men out there who are not Christians. Okay. So I want to, I want to start off with that. But I want to say this, and, and, and I loved it on your website. You talked about men becoming their best version. Mm-hmm. I believe this, and you believe that a man can never 
even though he can be a great man without Jesus, a man can never be his best version without Jesus because God created that man. God gifted that man. God talented that man. God has given that man a mission and a purpose in his life. And if that man rejects Jesus, he's never going to climb as high as he would have climbed with Jesus. That's right. It's just a fact. I don't have to argue it. Everybody, mm-hmm. in a, I mean, most Americans I talk to believe there's a God. If you mm-hmm. believe a God and you carry it out to conclusion, how can you ever be? It's Christianity to me is so simple. Mm-hmm. We just need to radically devote ourselves to the God who created us if Absolutely. we want to be our best version. And yes. so when I talk to guys, their eyes light up. They're like, wait, you mean I don't have to speak in tongues? You don't, I don't have to memorize the Bible? You know, you know, I don't, wait, church doesn't save me? I'm like, no, you know, these are all, you know, things that maybe are important to you or your church, depending on where you attend. But the most important thing is you got to get Jesus right. Mm. We got to pursue God. So the apex of manhood is, is, is Jesus. So he, he protects integrity, fights apathy, pursues God passionately. The, the, the backside of the mountain, the descent is something that's very dangerous. And I've discovered this after 25 years of church ministry and even the last, you know, several years of doing this ministry that a lot men will understand Jesus, but then they deferred leadership to the Mm -hmm. pastor and the church. Mm -hmm. And so I see men, you know, I'm a hunter, right? And I I can't tell you how many times packing a buck out of the wilderness, I'm sliding down the hill until one day my cousin said, Jimmy, put your nose over your toes. Mm -hmm. So now I'm leaning perpendicular to the mountain, which is really a scary place to be. It's also the only place I have traction. More men and women die every year above the death zone, which is 26,000 feet on Mount Everest, descending the mountain. Mm -hmm. than ever die climbing the mountain. It's the descent that's dangerous. And so what we realize is men can't put their brakes on. They can't lean back. They need to lead courageously, which is point Mm -hmm. four. Mm -hmm. Leading courageously. Men are wired by God as leaders. That is the mantle that we have been given by God to carry. It's innate within us. And then the last thing that a man does, and this goes back to all the pastors I've seen that haven't finished, is, is men finish strong. Mm. We live in a world that really rewards people for finishing wrong, but a man, not a male, a man runs a pace to finish strong. You know, in Galatians mm-hmm. 6, 9, do not grow weary in doing good for at the proper time you'll reach a, reap a, re- a reward. Mm-hmm. You'll reap the harvest. And then I'm reading about Jesus in Hebrews chapter 12 and how, you know, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of, of the father consider him who endured Mm -hmm. such hostility at the hands of sinful men. You know, it's really about the endurance and the grit of Jesus. And I wish that the church taught more about true grit and this biblical virtue of endurance that will help us to finish our races strong. So Mm -hmm. he protects integrity. He fights apathy. Again, these are what a man does. These are not who a man is. Mm -hmm. Protects integrity, fights apathy, pursues God passionately, leads courageously, and finishes strong. Those five things really cover everything else about what a man does to make him one. A man is as a man does. Yeah, I have been having some conversations recently just because I am in full-time ministry. So I've been in full-time ministry now for 15 years. Thank you for doing that. Yeah, and uh, but I can tell you it's hard. And I, and I can also tell you how much of a, from somebody who I'm not defending the, uh, the people who you said have fallen away, who were in, in ministry and not moral failures. I'm not defending them at all. I'm telling my story. Yeah. And so everybody's story is, is different, but the one commonality is ministry is a grind. It is a grind. In, in, in it's a grind, but you, in order to finish strong, like when I look at this, you know, at the mountain illustration, I've actually got it written down right next to me. Like this is not just something that you do once. This is <laughs> like, this is just the, the cycle of what a man does. And I'll be honest with you, you know, there's a time where I would say that, you know, somebody in just pursuing God passionately and they're like, yes, you know, they're, they're all about it. But maybe some things happen at the church. They have a disagreement. Maybe their pastor isn't a strong leader. Maybe that's the problem. It's like and then every time that they have an idea of forwarding something for men in the church or they read, you know, why men hate church from David Morrow. I think that's his book. And yeah. maybe they're challenged like that and say, Pastor, I'll buy you this book if you read it. And then a guy, after a while, a guy just beats his head against the wall and he says, I, I'm done. Yep. I, I give up. And, and that's obviously 
you know, you're breaking all sorts of the things that you talk about here, fighting apathy. Eventually, if when a man gives up, he's going to become apathetic and he's going to fall back down the mountain. He's never going to be able to finish strong because they give up too soon. And leading courageously, it more than likely that in my experience, and again, it's, it's a smaller amount of experience. You have more experience in this than I do, Jim. But what I've seen is when men get to this point, usually they just check out of church altogether and they go home and they, they have a hobby that they do on Sunday. And if the wife and kids go to church, that's great. He's going to be in his hobby. And then they're probably going to have lunch after church. And, you know, and that's kind of the, usually that's kind of the, the tale of, you know, the, the tale of the tape at the end of that. Well, it's interesting because I, I've heard a phrase and there's so much truth to it, Chad. It, it's a phrase I've heard from men. Hey, I'd rather be in the mountains thinking about God on Sunday than yes. in the church, thinking about the mountains. And the, you know, when I talked about these five mm -hmm. aspects, protecting integrity, fighting apathy, these are all in my book, The Man Card, mm -hmm. Pursuing God, which I'd be willing to give you, mail you out some, you can give them away if you want. Mm -hmm. uh, leading, pursuing God passionately, leading courageously and finishing strong. Maybe more important than the definition themselves is the progressive tense of the verb. I-N-G. It's something that I have to do every day because I can have integrity today and tomorrow I can blow it. I can That's pursue right. God today and tomorrow not pursue him at all. And what I have seen and what you're talking about is when a man does not work in that progressive verb tense mm -hmm. in a day, it's not a problem at all. Sure. In a week, it's not really a big deal, but in a, in a month, in a year, it becomes a massive, massive falling mm -hmm. away from the values that we try to adhere to as men. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So let's drill down into these for just a little bit. Protecting integrity. I, yeah. I think this is a, honestly, when I read the book, uh, I thought this was an interesting way to begin. I know why you began there, but I thought this was interesting. And I realized that if, uh, if, if you don't set your, set your sights on the right thing, and if you betray yourself internally, right, lacking integrity and, and not worthy of honor in this way, then you're, you're failing before you start. But how would you help a guy who, who needs to grow in this area? And, he, and maybe right now he's having an aha. He's just listened to this and he's like, I want to read the book, but, but before I read the book and I get all the practical stuff that's in it, how would you help this guy to begin the process of protecting integrity? Okay. Well, I would say that there's two things that, that you're bringing up. That's a great question, by the way. The first thing is he needs to identify any breaches in integrity. I had a, a mm -hmm. I got, I was a running back in college and I got hit. I had a real, real, I couldn't walk for the next couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. My coach thought it was a pansy. After an x-ray, I found a, on my fibula, I had a two inch long hairline fracture. Mm -hmm. And so we need to be able to identify integrity breaches. Well, which, which means we need to have a wife who has the guts enough to call us out mm -hmm. if we're married. And we have to have friends that are willing to confront us. So we need to, and so some of us, I mean, I'm pretty good at this point of identifying a breaches and in integrity, but mm -hmm. who's going to help us with our blind spots? So between myself, my wife, and my friends, I've got three people there, three different entities that, and not to mention the Holy Spirit in me, right? Of course. He's in me, he's with me to, to, to tell me that I have a breach. Mm -hmm. So once I identify a breach, for example, for me, I have got a problem with food. Mm -hmm. I've got a problem with food. I have all my life. So that to me is an integrity breach because it leads to gluttony. It leads to sloth, leads to health issues, right? Mm -hmm. So with me personally, if you look at the food problem, I have to identify that problem as a problem of integrity. And then mm -hmm. I have to confess it and mm -hmm. repent of it. And so I would tell the guys listening, if you, if, you know, first of all, identify areas where you have an integrity breach mm -hmm. and then, and then confess that breach, pull it out of the darkness into the light. Mm -hmm. And then, and when I say repent, Chad, I recognize you're a pastor. We don't repent once we yes. repent over and over. It's a daily repentance. I mean, I repent and repent. And Gary Thomas wrote a book on, uh, called, uh, sacred pathways, I think. And mm -hmm. he said that the, the sign of a true disciple is your battle and your struggle against sin. So once I pull it out of the darkness into the light, now I start battling it until mm -hmm. I have victory. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would tell a guy. And I, and, and I would say, don't ever give up. I mean, I've been battling lust all my life. I've been battling food all my life. I've been battling, you know, negative, you know, 
being cr overly critical of others all my life. Mm. So do I just lay back and go, hey, I'm a fat slob, you know, you know, dirty, rotten, sexual scoundrel. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm way, making this way worse than it is, by the way, you know, who hates all people. No, I'm going to continue to battle and become more like mm. Christ-like. So. Yeah. And that, and that pursuit, I say integrity in this way, and I'm probably not the first one who said it this way. So I would, I would give somebody credit, but I'm not going to, I'm just going to take this one. Um, <laughs> that integrity is being honest on the outside about what's going on on the inside. So yeah, it's that's like beautiful. Of, of who you truly are. DL Moody, Moody, you're from Chicago, uh, Illinois. DL Moody said, integrity is who you are in the dark. Mm, there you go. There yeah. you go. Yeah. And, and to me, that's really what you, like those, those core issues that you have in your life that you talked about and you exaggerated for the point, I understand. But yeah. even those things, it's like, that's being honest about being honest on the outside of what's going on on the inside. On the outside, you're inviting in your wife saying, Hey, this is a problem. I need, I need some help. You know, it's being honest with God, you know, and then the Holy Spirit of God revealing in you yeah. the sin that is against him. So now you have the, the, the internal work of the spirit of God. You have the external work, which to be honest with you, Jim, a lot of guys, their egos can't take for their, their wives to actually give them any sort of correction. And, but anyway, that's, that's another thing. Uh, it, it, it's their gift. <laughs> right. You know, it's, but honestly, and, and then the other side of it is, is friends is bringing on, you know, a brother to say, Hey, this is, this is an issue that I struggle with. And to me, this is where some accountability can come in. Accountability only works if you know what the issue is. Yeah. And if you initiate fixing it, that's right. That's right. So this is, that's part of the integrity. Yes. Being honest on the outside about what's going on on the inside. I say, brother, I'm going to be honest with you. I struggle with this. Can you call me, you know, whenever? Can I call you whenever? You know, and then some agreed upon thing. If it doesn't work, find another guy. Maybe he doesn't get her. Or maybe find, you know, what Stephen Mansfield talks about, a band of brothers. Yes, for sure. You know, yeah. which I think that's a better solution. But all right, so let's progress up the mountain now. Yep. And I love hiking. So, and I love being on the Appalachian Trail. So this whole analogy and all this, it, it, it was like right in my wheelhouse. I love it. Appreciate but, it. Um, going uphill, fighting apathy. And very apropos for, for going uphill, right? Because yep, you're sure. apathetic. So why is it that men struggle so much with, with apathy? Well, I'll tell you what. I do a message that uh, causes people to turn their heads, and it's an expository sermon out of Genesis 3, and it's mm -hmm. called Helping Men Deal with PMS. Mm -hmm. And, and they, the women look at me funny, and I, <laughs> I go, passive male syndrome. Yeah, that's great. You know, it all goes back to the garden, man. I mean, I don't know what the heck mm -hmm. Adam was doing if he was trying to figure out how Eve didn't have a belly button or if – I don't know what he was doing in that moment. Yeah. But, you know, the Bible says that she gave it to her husband who was with her. And so he, he went flat, man. He, he got passive. And, um, you know, uh, Robert Lewis with a manhood fraternity, I think he's out of Atlanta or maybe Arkansas, but he, he's the first guy who ever semi-defined manhood to me. And he talked about a man accepts responsibility and rejects passivity. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, responsibility was not the end game. The end game is integrity. And to me, to reject passivity is not the end game. The end game was not that, he, that, Adam failed to reject something. The end game was he did not care enough about his wife to step on that serpent on the head and mm -hmm. throw it in the throw it in the fire and rescue his wife, as our 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 mutual friend John Elder says, rescue his beauty, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so to me, it all started there, and it's been the. I think this. I think it's the greatest battle a man will ever fight. The word apathy is not even found in the Bible. In fact, the word apathy wasn't even invented or used until I think 1568 AD. Hmm. But, but if you go back in the Bible, the word in the Bible that's similar to apathy is the word callousness. Mm -hmm. And three times in the Bible, the scripture is quoted in the book of Acts, in the book of Isaiah and Matthew. So we have gospels, Old Testament, and then we have that transitionary book called Acts, where, where three times it's quoted as, this, my people have, are calloused, they have hardened their hearts. Mm -hmm. And so there's this, this this temptation for men to harden their heart. If a man refuses to uh, love and nurture his wife, he has a hard heart. 
an mm-hmm. unfeeling heart, a careless heart. If he doesn't connect with his kids, either in the home or after a divorce, he has a hardened heart. How about the 80% of men in your church probably right now, your church that don't give or serve, they're just empty seat, anonymous guys filling a chair in your church. Mm -hmm. Now for the bigger churches, it's probably more pronounced and the smaller churches, not so much, but these are guys that are apathetic. They don't care about their church or they don't care about their community. Mm -hmm. Uh, This is a, this is the greatest battle men will fight to get beyond themselves and to feel again. Like I I like to take Mm -hmm. a knife and cut a callus off my hand hmm. as an illustration of, look, I just cut up my flesh. And I couldn't feel a thing. And so this is a battle hmm. that men neglect because they don't necessarily recognize it. It's not something that pastors preach on because it's not, it's all throughout the Bible, but the word is not used throughout the Bible. Mm-hmm. So pastors tend to overlook it. Look at David and Rehoboam. That hmm. was a problem with parenting. What happened to you, bro? Look mm-hmm. at King Solomon. He went from the wisest guy in the world to the biggest idiot to ever live yeah. to the point where in Ecclesiastes, he's going, it's all like chasing after the wind. What happened, Solomon? Well, you act like an idiot marrying a thousand mm-hmm. women. You got apathetic towards your own holiness. Mm-hmm. And so uh, it's all throughout the Bible. We just don't see the word. Mm-hmm. So it's a massive problem for me and for you and for every, everybody. <laughs> Well, and I like it, what you're talking about, too, because you're actually pointing to the problem. A lot of times I think we just look at the symptoms. Even if we Absolutely. look at the Bible, we look at, oh, well, look what happened. Yeah, but, but what drove them to that place? Absolutely. Like, look, look at King David. I'm sorry, I, I shouldn't have cut in. Look at King David. <laughs> it says, it. when the kings went off to war, yes. King David was on the patio staring at naked Bathsheba. Well, right. What happened? He got apathetic. He got lazy. Mm. He, he leaned back. Yeah. He, he didn't. He didn't do his uh, what he was strong at, and he got out of his sweet spot, and it created mm-hmm. a, a havoc in his life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that, and I think that also speaks into finishing strong too and leading courageously. He wasn't leading because when the kings were off at war, and where was he? Not there. So he's just sitting back, you know, in an easy chair, just apathetic really in many different areas and then you see it revealed with Bathsheba and then after that failure it's compounded by the murder of her husband who by the way people don't realize this but Uriah was one of the 30 mighty men Mm -hmm. and their homes were situated around the palace to protect the king so the king comes out on the palace patio and he's looking down into these homes of his mighty men who guard him. Mm. And so that's how he was. And I think the old city of David was only nine acres. It wasn't this huge place. Mm-hmm. So he was able to, so is the guy who was commissioned to protect him as a mighty man was the very man that David murdered and stole his wife. It's crazy. Wow. Uh, it's crazy how dangerous apathy can be. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, you know, I, I know that you're, you're in this work, you're full bore into it as I am. And, and unfortunately, a lot of times, guys, they don't see it. They don't see that they've been apathetic until they've already had the train wreck. They've lost their marriage. They've lost their kids. They've lost friends. They're, you know, they removed from this or whatever. They, you know, they lost their home or they lost a job or they got fired. And it's like, what happened? It's like, well, because you weren't in. Like you were just, you were a warm body. Well, and it goes back to the trailhead, right? If you're apathetic, that there's an error in your life or there's an integrity issue, you need to fix that mm-hmm. so you can keep climbing. So that's why it's all all the stuff pieces together. And as men were compartmentalized, we want to say, oh, there's these five areas. No, they're all blended. Mm-hmm. They're all blended. Mm-hmm. Well, and I look at really the the four pillars of my work rooted in Luke two fifty two that Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. So of those four pillars. I can look at those, those as well, and not necessarily overlaying it over these five ideas, but I can see how these four pillars have to be active in a man's life or else he won't be able to do these five things. Oh, absolutely. So when you talk about those four pillars, I'm, I, I'm interpreted a little bit differently. Mm-hmm. I think he grew in wisdom. He grew mm-hmm. intellectually. Mm-hmm. He grew in stature. He grew physically. Yep. He grew in favor with God. He grew spiritually mm-hmm. and he grew in favor with men. He grew socially. So Mm-hmm. intellectual or mentally, spiritually, socially, physically. So those four areas, that's a man stands on those four areas. And if mm-hmm. he's out of 
I, some people hate this word balance. Mm -hmm. He's going to lean. He's going to tilt. That's he's right. going to have a foundation issue. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Actually, I, I'm in agreement with that too, because you said social, I say relational. So it's, it's virtually same the same thing. Same, same phrase. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And that, and that illustration is something I use as well because everybody can, everybody knows what it's like to sit in a chair with, with one leg that's uneven and rocking back and forth and it's not stable. And how, how far back can I go without falling over? And so I look at, uh, I look at those four pillars and then again, these five principles and I'm thinking, hmm, I like it. I like yeah. it. Maybe, uh, maybe after this next book of yours, we'll put together the four pillars and these five things. We'll make our own book. Who knows? Well, you know, Weber already has his four pillars of a man's heart, but yeah. <laughs> That's true. Mine are a little different though. One thing that I thought was, I did like about, about four pillars of a man's heart. What I looked at there is this is, another element of like who a man becomes not necessarily what a man does. Like a man has to do some things to be a warrior, to be a King, to be the lover and to be the friend. So when I look and I love the book, it was incredible. And tender warrior I thought was incredible too. Yeah. Uh, I read that. I read tender warrior first and I've taken guys through both of those books. But when I look at these pillars, the only thing I that I the see the thing that I see lacking in them is they need some other things defining them to stand upon, like to be the king. Well, what does that mean? Well, to me, I can look at the four pillars of my work, and I'm not I'm definitely not knocking Stu Weber's books because I think he's phenomenal. And I've taken Absolutely. my son through heart the heart of a, a tender word. It's a, the thin thin book when he was a teenager. Uh -huh. Yeah. But when I look at these things, I'm like, I think they need some other qualifiers. Agreed. Well, I agree. I mean, I think most men, I think most men aren't, aren't Kings. I, I think that word is too loose. So I think it, um, most men are followers. They're not a King, right. but I think that, I think a better word to be a leader, yeah. you know, most men, I think are warriors. I think they've got a battle. Uh, I, you know, I think, and then the elders talks about men as King, warrior, lover, and sage pillar talks, Weber talks about King, warrior, mentor and friend. Mm. And so there are several things I agree with. I don't think you can use the word lover in a general sense because many men are single. Mm -hmm. Many men are young men who aren't married yet. Right. And so, and, and we're, and so I think with uh, Weber, I think friend, I, I think that um, I don't like that word because I think most men isolate on their default mm -hmm. where women tend to be more socially gathered. But mm -hmm. I think that uh, growing relationally is very important for men because it doesn't come as easy for men. And it's mm -hmm. very important for a man. And so I wouldn't call it a, I would, I would side on your side of this more because I think these are areas that says, and Jesus grew mm -hmm. in these four areas. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're talking about. You're talking about growing in these four areas mm -hmm. where, where, where Weber, I think in his book talks about men more as it's an innate quality, which I'm not sure I agree with that. I think mm -hmm. I, I would side more with you that they grow in those areas. Yes. Well, as far as the friend, you know, we, from before we started recording and then now just again, Jimmy repeated this, this idea about friend and how ladies are more, you know, that women are more social than men. Of course, we know that every, every man knows that you go yeah. to a man's event. And it's like, this guy's in this corner, this guy's in this corner, this, you know, four corners of the room. And you're like, oh crap, all four are taken. Where do I stand now? And yet the ladies, they're all together. So I think we, we just, we intuitively know that, but do you think that that's more of uh, God's intent and design, or do you think that that our our seclusion from one another is more effective the fall? And and just in case you you men are aware, the fall you can find in the Bible in Genesis three, and it talks about the fall of mankind. Really, the fall of creation is there too, and just that we're still feeling the effects of the fall. So, so what would you to to uh, what would be your input there, Jim? Yeah, I, I, I don't think it's enough. I personally don't think it's a result of the fall. Let me explain. Okay. You know, you, you quoted Mansfield's small little booklet called Band of Brothers. My favorite television show series ever is HBO's Band of Brothers following the one on the first Airborne on D-Day and then the subsequent uh, until we had VE Day, the Victory mm -hmm. Over Europe Day. And so one of the things that women, let me, let me tell you what I think. I may be wrong. Women will rally around relationships for the sake of relationship. Mm -hmm. So they will relate because that's what women love to do. 
They mm-hmm. have no other reason but just, oh, let's let's relate. Let's have a relationship. Mm-hmm. But what men do, and this is the this is where I think men in our society, it looks like a result of the fall, but it, I don't think it is. I think it's a cultural thing. Men rally around mission and mm-hmm. purpose. So when I look at Weber's king pillar and warrior pillar and mentor pillar, mentor is a, pur- a strategic purpose. The mm-hmm. warrior pillar, we're going to battle together. You know, um, I think these are really important pillars. The king pillar you can't have a king without the paupers, right? You've got to have your, mm-hmm. and so what I see, I see in my life that I have built the deepest relationships with men who I have a purpose with. We coached together. Mm-hmm. We did, I, I'm still a, still dear friends with the men on my Wyoming hunt because it was such a disaster. We <laughs> rallied around a disaster. You know, the guys who I played football with, I, I have a high school scholarship that I started at my alma mater and I'm just calling my buddies. I made four calls and I got $3,000 donated because we rallied around pain and suffering of this awesome. sport. And so I think men rally around something together. Mm-hmm. So I think what we can do is if we can create those opportunities through missions trips, mm-hmm. through um, uh, having a, a sports team or affinity groups. Uh, mm-hmm. Some men need a purpose Uh, to rally behind. Mm -hmm. And when they don't rally behind that purpose, we see a a diminishing of the relationship Mm -hmm. because we're so designed to be that warrior, to be that conqueror, to be that guy, you know, finding our hill to die on. Mm -hmm. And I see the the apathy piece there. It can become an obstacle too, because if we're going to gather together for purpose, say it's, we're going to have a barbecue at my house and, you know, BYOM, bring your own meat, right? Yeah. Girl's, girl's going to be hot, cook whatever you want. Um, if we're going to do that, to me, it's like if, if this was a lady's thing, again, they're going to meet socially, just get together just for the sake of, hey, we're all getting together. And men are like, I've got 14 different things to do right now to spend. I've got different ways to spend this afternoon. So they're probably not going to come to this barbecue unless there is a purpose behind it. Well, and think about this. A w- women do all these little parties, oh, candle party, jewelry party. Mm-hmm. So you know, Pampered Chef, you know you're going to this woman's house to give her your money. <laughs> and yeah. women do it. Men go, hell no, I'm not doing that. That's stupid. <laughs> but if you tell a man, hey, we're going to go eat some meat, or we're going to yeah. go climb a mountain, or we're going to go shoot a gun, or we're going to go uh, battle a fight for a cause, Men are going to go do that because they're purpose and missional. Right. Women aren't. In fact, women, like I said, well, they'll give somebody money just to have a relationship. Yeah. You, bro, you would never get me doing that. Yeah. Right. And so, because we are so now, I would say that, hey, come over, we're going to grill some meat. I think that's missional on the low, low, low level. Yeah. And that'll get guys together, but that won't keep them together. Mm-hmm. What will keep them together is, hey, guys, we're going to have a meat, we're going to have a meat eating deal at my house. And we're going to talk about uh, uh, our, our, for example, for my, at my church, we're going to, I have a team of guys and we put together our men's retreat every year. And these guys are super tight mm. because that men's retreat has rallied them around a purpose. Mm-hmm. Think about people in the worship band at a church. Think about uh, guys that are, look, my kids hunting ducks with me. Now, now it's turkey season. Now they're begging me turkeys. I'm so excited when my youngest son goes with my middle son yesterday to hunt turkeys. To me, that's two young men who have transcended mm-hmm. brother, and they've now they have w- moved into this brotherhood mm-hmm. realm. And so that's that's what we're talking about: men rallying uh, behind a cause. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's great. And truthfully, there's there should be no greater cause than forward in the kingdom of God, when when the men of God gather together in the name of God to expand the kingdom of God. There should be no greater cause, and and really the you know, where I'm going to plant my flag is, is declaring for the for men of God, for people who are, are born again Christians, as men to say, you know what, it's not going to be that way in my watch. It's not going to be that way in my church. I don't know what needs to change. If I need to change, somebody needs to change. It's not going to be that way. We're going to reclaim like manhood. We're going to reclaim that in Jesus name. I, I just wish that that message would then kind of carry out, honestly, through, throughout all of, of the churches, big and small, no matter what denomination they are, if I agree with them or don't agree with them. But again, you know, when a man gets it, everyone wins. That's right. And, and that's a, that's such a powerful 
truth. And, you know, the people that I'm connected with socially, and I would say the people I'm connected with socially, when I'm talking about this through social media. So I have just the ability, and, and I think God's just connected me with men, where I can go real deep into conversations, and yet it's difficult to bring that depth into, into my local church. And, and I, I say this, I mean, my perspective is different, right? Because I'm the leader of the church. But I think that this is probably even true in most churches, if you're just, just a guy who attends church and faithfully contributes. So why is it easier, in your opinion, because I'm literally scratching my head about this, why is it easier for a man who, you know, lives in Oregon? Okay, I realize you live in Oregon, but not yeah. you, but a guy who lives in Oregon to connect with me through social media and to share me with share with me what's going on in his life and, and trust me with some things rather than somebody who I know who lives over on Main Street. Why is that the case, Jim? Well, <laughs> I'll tell you what I think. And I've had this conversation with many of the leaders of my church who are men. Uh, I consider myself a, a good speaker. I get hired to go speak, you know. Um, but when it comes to my church, the men who connect the deepest at our church connect over donuts and coffee. Mm. It's what happens before and after church that really impact the men. So creating that opportunity to have relationships. So, mm -hmm. so, so, and I think the other thing is as a believer in Jesus, you asked the question, how did you and I do it from to, you know, we're at Georgia, you mm -hmm. know, uh, I've got a board member who lives in St. Simon's Island, Georgia. So you got Georgia to Oregon. How do we do it? Well, the name of Jesus, that, that name puts us under a rallying cry. Mm -hmm. And so we instantly are able to operate on a level way deeper than those who don't follow Jesus. That's why I say that a summit of manhood is pursuing God passionately, because unless you pursue God passionately, until you do that up here, your relationships are going to be here. My relationships with wonderful men that I love, wonderful men, great men, family men, working men, wealthy men who don't know Jesus, my relationship is always a false summit. Mm. It's a false summit. It never gets to the depth or the height or the breadth that it should, because they do not have the capacity to get there because they've not achieved the summit of manhood, which is Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. which is why you and I can d dive deep into questions. You know, I can't talk to uh, some of these guys about, let's say, pornography. They think mm -hmm. it's okay. I can't talk to them about giving giving to, you know, 10% plus to my to people I care and causes I care about. They don't understand that worldview because they have not done that. That's right. And so there's a real, a huge, it's a false summit where these guys go, Hey, I'm there. No, you're, you're not there. You really aren't there. And so that to me, I think is a, a, a major difference. And a, uh Oh, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, I thought I lost you. Sorry about yeah. that. I no hit problem. something weird. Your screen went blank. <laughs> I apologize. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. I think the, uh, the false summit idea, uh, you know, that, that kind of picture is, is a fair one too. And then, and then I think once that false summit is hit, then the, and I hadn't really connected this until just now, I think this is the reason why a lot of men settle for caricatures of men. So instead of hitting that summit, then they, they become, they put on a, a face. I'm the gym guy. I'm the football guy. I'm the wrestler guy. I'm the Harley guy. I'm the beer drinking guy. I'm the whatever guy. It's like, you, and then it, then becoming like a character of a man because at the end of the day, they're incomplete. So they're yeah. kind of grasping because they haven't hit that, that high point. Well, it's really tough to become your best version when you don't even know what that version is supposed to look like. Right. So I think what happens is this caricature theory is, is accurate, not because men are trying to cover up a, 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 a fake or a weakness. I think because men don't know any other way. Mm. And so they default to what they've seen. Yeah. And so we have, uh, we have said in our society that, you know, a man who is an artist who drives a Prius, who loves little teeny, you know, little dogs and, and cats is, is, is somehow inferior to a lifted Ford F-350 lumberjack who has a bulldog, you know, a 300 right. pound American, a 150 pound American bulldog for his pet that eats kitties, you know, <laughs> for some reason we've, we've said that this is a man and this isn't. So a man will default to that. 
and our media says that as well, right? Yeah. The, the guys in the media that are stars are this guy over here. And so a man will default to that because he doesn't know anything else. Mm-hmm. Well, you and I are trying to give them something else. And I think that we have yeah. spurred some great things in this conversation. So Jim, I want to thank you so much for coming on and just giving us wisdom and breaking down this book. And, uh, and actually I have an extra copy of this book. So I'm actually going to have this in a, a little contest, if you will, a little somehow raffle this off. So somebody's going to get it and I'll tell everybody in my circle that they need to read it. It's great. I thought it was a great read. And, uh, and you actually brag about it being a bathroom read, which I thought was awesome. Uh, just <laughs> yeah. Go in there and, and there's good quality of stuff, but yet it doesn't take forever to get through. And really there's no fluff. Yeah. Which, which I think men need and they respond well to. Well, we want a book, you know, it's like 70% of book purchases on Barnes, on Barnes and Noble are women. Right. So how do we get a man to read a book? Well, we need to make it simple to mm-hmm. the point, And we need to put a lot of stories in there. Mm-hmm. You know, like we, with this podcast, I think will be very good for you because you asked the question, tell me a story. Right. And I told a good one. And so, <laughs> so that brings is. the guys go, wow, I'm engaged in story now yeah. because as men we're visual, we're storytellers. You know, I never preach a sermon without an object lesson. I always have something in my hand so the men can mm-hmm. see it. And, uh, that, and that's just, so that's what we did today. So I appreciate you asking that question. That was mm-hmm. a great question and you did a great job uh, on the interview. So I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, before we go, what are three books that you would suggest that every man read? Oh gosh, you're killing me. Okay. Just, so uh, just for, three. For, no, 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 that's easy. For sure. Wild at heart. Yeah. If you haven't read wild at heart, you absolutely need to read it. And then I would say, um, I'm going to go non-Christian here uh, just to help you out here. Uh, I, I would say either read the story of Ernest Shackleton on the endurance. There's a book out there called Endurance or read the story of Teddy Roosevelt uh, called The River of Doubt. Those, mm. One of those two books is so epic. It'll just inspire you to manhood. Uh, we've talked about Four Pillars of uh, Man's Heart by Stu Weber. I would say for sure that book. And then I'll throw a bonus book in there. Uh, I, uh, Reggie Campbell, he has a ministry called uh, Random. I'm not random. Radical Mentoring. Reggie just died about two months ago. Hmm. He wrote a book called What Radical Husbands Do. It's a little teeny small book. It's smaller than my book. Hmm. I, when I had him on the podcast, I thought, oh, well, I don't know who this guy is. It is the best book on marriage I've ever read. Really? For men. It is. I'm not kidding you. It's only 120 pages. And it's, it's super simple. And th- I'll tell you what, Reggie is dead now, but he hit it out of the park on this book. Hmm. Every man should pick up this book and read what radical husbands do. You're just going to be blown away by this book. Do not let the cover and the size of the book fool you. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, I've, I've actually never heard of that. So Nobody has. <laughs> uh, yeah, high recommendation. It's so good. And then he's got a, he's died, but he's got a guy, uh, Kevin Harris is the president of his organization and uh, they're still going full throttle. And so uh, Reggie lives on, man. And he's out of, uh, he attended uh, Andy Stanley's church in Atlanta. So he's in Georgia. He's a Georgia boy. Okay. Wow. Yeah, He was a Georgia boy. Now he's a heaven boy. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, Jim, thanks so much for coming on to the show today. It's been great. I think that we stirred up some uh, great points of conversation. And I think we're actually trying to get a date for me to be on your show sometime in the future. I think I'm setting that up with Dale and Sammy. So, um, so I look forward to that. So thank you again. All right, brother. Have a great day and uh, glad I could help.